Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line. This week, I'm recording from Sydney, Australia, where I've recently relocated. So I decided to pay a visit to one of the nation's most popular podcasters, the very funny and very smart Dan Illich, host of Irrational Fear. So funny, in fact, that it was awarded the best comedy podcast by the Australia Podcast Awards three consecutive years in a row. His show features journalists, experts, politicians, and comedians using comedy to explore climate change, press freedom, and environmental issues. You may have seen Dan on CNN back in 2021 during COP26 being interviewed by Jake Tapper for his crowdfunding effort to post satirical billboards in Times Square to draw attention to Australian policy surrounding the climate crisis at the time, with jokes such as, cuddle a koala before we make them go extinct. I chatted with Dan about his popular podcast, The Impact of Science Communication and Comedy in Environmental and Climate Justice, and current affairs related to the cancellation of oil and gas projects thanks to the work of activists and indigenous communities and leaders. I had a really great time talking with Dan. He's very funny, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. This is, uh, by the way, I'm like just taking mental notes because I have to do this at my place too. Uh-huh. This isn't, I mean, the room itself, the room itself isn't too bad. The mics are a pretty good dynamic mic. So right, if you get close right. enough, they're pretty good. Wow. These are, what are these, Rode? These are Rode. These are pod mics. My, you know, great Australian company, Rode, really. One, yeah. of the, one of the best, one didn't, of the best Australian companies in the world. Didn't know it was an Australian company. That's mm. good, good to know. I'm Repping the local gear, you know? <laughs> That's great. D- would you like to sit here? This is like the broadcasting position. Is that, or are you happy with I that? feel like it's more appropriate <laughs> okay. that you get to sit in your All right, room. yeah. You know, it's weird. It's weird because it's your podcast, but I'm recording. <laughs> right. I, I am a guest in your studio. So, uh, Dan, it's, it's awesome to meet you and speak with you. So thanks for sitting down and chatting with me on the Mogabay newscast today. I just want to take a, an acknowledgement of country. We are on Gadigal land recording in Eora country. Oh, well done. That's excellent work. Congratulations. Acknowledgement of country from a new person in Australia. That is fantastic. One of the, um, one of the cult, great cultural exports of this country, I think, aside from uh, road microphones and uh, black magic gear, which we mentioned before, right, off mic, right. is the acknowledgement of country. Like seeing that travel around the world, I feel like in Australia, it was kind of a kind of one of the first places to do it and then see it catch on, particularly in progressive podcasts in America. And you know, Tida Watiti at the Emmys and you know at award ceremonies, seeing that kind of percolate through, it's like wow! Like we've been doing this for twenty years, and now you can now you can, if you open up your ears, you can hear it happening around the world. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, it's starting to take shape now in, in, in the U.S. a little bit more and more. Um, at least a friend of mine was talking about that it, it started to really like take shape here over the past like five to ten years. Mm. Can you tell us more about that? In First Nations. Various First Nations groups do what they call a welcome to country, which is uh, when a passerby is traveling through your country, they do a welcome. They they give you uh, a, like a bit of history of the land. They give you the context for how the land is part of their culture and how you're welcome to that land to participate and greet the land as a community member itself. Um, and then kind of as things moved people who were settlers to uh, this colonized land started to acknowledge the country that they were on as visitors to the country itself. And so I would say, I would say over 15 years, maybe 20 years, that has really been a thing. Um, And now it's, it's kind of, it's very much in the culture now in Australia. And I would say, I'm, I'm, I would say I moved to America maybe 10 years ago and never heard it. And then in recent times, you know, I've been hearing it piece a little bit here and there. So, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Nice. Well, um, so, Dan, uh, first let's talk about your podcast, Irrational Fear, which impressively has won three best comedy podcasts of the year at the Australia Podcast Awards three years in a row. Yeah, that's right. We now have more trophies than listeners. It's uh, <laughs> pretty good, pretty satisfying stuff. Well, that is a congratulations. So I just kind of want to give you a chance here to sort of brag and toot your own horn. What <laughs> what do you think accounts for this? Why is this resonating so much, um, the way that you talk about climate change, politics, news, and the environment? Well, the podcast has been around for 10 years. And so we really started to 
really take off just before the pandemic and do it every week when I got first came back from America um, around 2018. And so with that cadence of publishing every week, it really started to build an audience. And then the pandemic happened and all of a sudden podcasts were a really hot media property. People were craving parasocial relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and so our podcast numbers really took off um, because we were getting great comedians to come to our podcast to have conversations about um, uh, the news and climate change. Um, and Australia in particular had just gone through extremely traumatic climate climate event. In 2019, Australia suffered the worst bushfires we've ever seen, um, probably on this planet. It was a nationwide bushfire event from the top to the bottom to the east to the west of this gigantic continent. The whole place was on fire. It was wild. And we lost 2 billion animals in that event. And uh, hectares, hectares and hectares of uh, not only bushland, but things that go with that, which is a complete biological systems, um, completely devastated. And these were climate-induced bushfires. Uh, I, at the time, around December 2019, I flew from um, Sydney to Kuala Lumpur, and I, I was just seeing smoke across the entire continent. It's a long flight to Kuala Lumpur. It's like eight hours. So if you're flying over the continent and you were seeing smoke for eight hours, that's not a good sign. And that was an extremely traumatic event, and uh, I think... Australians, for the first time in a long time, were woken up to what true, what being on the front lines of climate and disasters was all about. And I think that was when folks started to pay attention and started to attach themselves to uh, a rational fear in a way that gave people catharsis and understanding and a place to have a laugh about the complete dire situation that we face ourselves in. Yeah. I mean, that... And there was just that study that just got released that says that, that um, those bushfires may have been linked to the to the recent La Nina phenomenon that just that just occurred. Yeah, probably. Look, probably. Yeah, I mean, we were La Nina and El Nino, uh, uh, wild cycles that you know this this continent is particularly attuned to, and North America is too, uh, particularly California, and 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 the Rockies, and so it's it's kind of um, you know. It, we're kind of used to these cycles, but we certainly have never experienced uh, La Nina um, in a way that we had after those bushfires. So bushfires happened and then it was like a year of rain. It almost, it rained a lot, like incredible amounts of rain. And so as a result, a lot of those bushfire areas were flooded and many communities up and down the east coast of Australia had significant water problems because because of the floods so it was um yeah this weird thing where three years ago four years ago we we're suffering bushfires and two and a half years after we suffered floods and it's it's like aha climate disaster is really kind of coming home to roost yeah yeah i mean and it's it was kind of a tragic lead up to um cop 26 in, in glasgow and um there's actually something i wanted to talk about um your crowdfunding endeavor there you you raised a, a, a lot of money in a really short amount of time um, to buy billboards that you you put these uh, satirical designs on them um, from artist James Hiller um, from Brisbane. So I was wondering if you could talk about like like how all that went down and, and what was the response to these billboards that you had put up? Yeah, so Irrational Fear, what we like to do is we like to do comedy shows about climate change. So we, right. wanted, we wanted to go to Glasgow, right? Yeah. Uh, it was 2021. We wanted to go to Glasgow. But I don't know if you know, Around that time, there was this thing called COVID-19, which no one could go anywhere. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't know if you heard about it. I don't know, did you have it in America? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it turns out our health minister forgot to reply to the CEO of Pfizer, um, who uh, had offered Australia kind of first dibs on, on COVID vaccine. And so no, we didn't have any vaccines in Australia at the time. So we got vaccines. We were one of the last countries to get vaccines. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. It was, and it was this weird thing where... Uh, we couldn't go to Glasgow. Like none of us, like the risk of traveling out of the country at that, that point was too high to, to deal with. So well, I was stuck at home. Uh, I didn't have a good reason to tell the government that I needed to go to Glasgow to make comedy shows about the government's poor track record on climate. Um, and I wanted to really have an effect on the ground somewhere. So I went to COP21 in 2015 in Paris, which was incredible. And I ran... Um, fossil of the day for the Climate Action Network that year. And it was great. We did a daily show about climate 
about the losers of the talks, the climate change, of the climate talks. And Australia won or was in the top three for many days in a row. And that was really fun. And, um, and so I was like, well, that was a really fun experience. But what if we took a rational fear to Glasgow to do something similar uh, once a week there? And we couldn't go. So I was like, well, what can I do? I'm on day 91 of lockdown in Australia. And all I want to do is make fun of the government. I know I'm, I'm just going to go buy a billboard in Glasgow. So I found this shitty billboard. It was like $12,000 on the side of a road. And I could put three bits of artwork up. And Australia had just gone through this traumatic climate event. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to ask my listeners um, to buy it. I, I, I went and purchased it. And so I was on the hook for $12,000. Or I'd already paid the $12,000. And I'm like, well, I'll see if the listeners will help me, <laughs> will help me pay for this bill. Uh, and... Uh, in September, I hit go on the crowdfunding campaign and um, by 6.30 a.m. I hit go and then by 8.30 a.m. I'd gotten $12,000. <laughs> it's a lot. And I was like, oh, sh- oh that's great. That's fantastic. Um, well, that's paid for. But then the money kept rolling in. Right. Uh, and 12000 turned into 20000 By the end of the day, it was 40000 By the following day, it was 80000 By the end of the week, it was 90000 By the week after, it was like $200,000. And I was like, I don't know what the f*** I'm going to do. <laughs> so I thought, I decided, you know what? Uh, I learned three things. Australia really cares deeply about climate action. I'm going to need more billboards uh, and I'm going to need bigger billboards. So I decided to get the biggest billboard in Times Square, uh, which is a billboard called Godzilla. It is so big. That's what that's what the internal name is when you buy it. It's, right. Oh, you want the Godzilla billboard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have the Godzilla billboard. <laughs> it wraps around the Marriott Hotel in Times Square, um, and it's like it's on. You know, it's got three sides to it. Yeah. It's huge. Uh, so I bought it for ten minutes at dusk, and we ran uh, like ten more jokes on, on on that for ten minutes, and it was great. And at that time, I had uh, I invited all the Australians I knew in New York City, on a Facebook group. And I had like 160 RSVPs for that group. Uh, all the activists I used to work with in the New York area, I got them down there. And friends who work in media, I got them down there to take photos and videos. And and um, and it, even Russell Crowe tweeted Jake Tapper about the event. And he said, you know, hey, Jake Tapper, have you seen this? And Jake Tapper replied, thanks, Russell, I had not. And then... Then Russell DM'd me saying, it sent me like the screen grab, grabs of him texting Jake Tapper <laughs> about, <laughs> about the event and Jake saying, yeah, well, great, we'll get someone down there to cover it. Right. So, so Russell Crowe, uh, Russell Crowe was very instrumental in, uh, in getting coverage on this on CNN. So Jake Tapper had his crew cover it and then got me on on, on CNN the, the night after to talk about it. So uh, it was this uh, singular event that, I thought to myself, how can I use my power <laughs> as a guy sitting in my bedroom to cause maximum disruption <laughs> uh, for this moment to gain attention for this issue? Um, and really, it was to entertain myself because I thought it was very funny. And uh, but it also was to help folks feel engaged in a way that they felt like they were doing something as well. And what I since learned is that one of the most powerful things about that was that folks on the ground in Glasgow, activists, people in civil society, um, for anyone who goes to COP, um, who, if anyone who hasn't been to COP, rather, COP is like this gigantic family reunion of corporate interests, of governments, of policymakers, of climate denialists, of climate activists, all getting together to try and convince the people who uh, operate at the UN under the country's banner to move a semicolon or a, or a sentence or eliminate words to get a document that's about 15 pages long to give you some kind of consensus on climate action. That's what's happening. You've got thousands of people all, all trying to hustle to get their piece of the pie uh, in a kind of consensus. And what I didn't realize was that the activists on the ground there and the people that are working in climate there were so grateful for that moment because they were like, finally you know, we don't, we're not pariahs. We can show the world that the people that represent Australia there don't necessarily represent Australians. We had this enormous buy-in from Australians to say that our, our government is really 
uh, the bad actor here. And that's that was exciting to me, to kind of give those folks who are on the ground there in Glasgow energy and enthusiasm to hold their heads up and kind of walk around the halls and have a laugh at, <laughs> at their own government's expense. And that's that's kind of thrilling to me, like to go, well, great, I gave people enthusiasm and that's that's all that counts. <laughs> And we're going to go ahead and uh, actually we're going to talk about some of those, you know, public and private type attitudes towards, uh, you know, things like biodiversity loss and climate change. Really quick, though, not to be awkward, um, because we are you, are you about to give a discount code to a mattress? Is this what's going to happen? <laughs> no, because Casper mattresses, uh, because we broadcast in like many countries. Uh, if we swear on the show, we kind of get dinged for it. So, oh, fuck. <laughs> So I have to bleep them. Sorry, sorry. It, it's okay. I have to bleep them out. I've le- I've learned I've learned never to say in front of an American. It's a horrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> Carry on, disregard. Right. No. Um. But e- with that said, so you know, um, and hopefully this doesn't get me deported. But let's go ahead and talk about public and private attitudes towards climate change and the environment. Um, particularly here in this continent country australia which has you know very delicate precious biodiversity um so what do you want people to know about australia's attitudes and policies towards the environment both on a public and private level well i think it's um it's it's interesting right now so we've had a change of government right and uh it's interesting to hear uh, well, the big international podcasts celebrate that. You know, they, they're they saying, you know, how great is it that, you know, Scott Morrison is out? How great is it that the Liberal Party is out of Australia? Um, and now we can move forward on climate action. Now this government's going to sign on to deeper uh, goals for, for climate action. And it's, yeah, that's nice. But it's very similar to where America is right now, where there's a lot of uh, talk, but where the rubber hits the road. Um, it's not so, not so forthcoming. So, um, unlike America, the great thing, you know, the IRA's incredible bill, it's going to accelerate a lot of great green transition. We don't really have that here. Uh, all that kind of stuff is operating at a state's level and it's already kind of in motion. So there's a lot of good stuff that's happening. Um, and then there's, there's stuff like, uh, hydrogen that's being kind of green hydrogen that's being sponsored by federal government, but it's not to the same extent as like fossil fuel subsidies. The fossil fuel subsidies have increased. Um, you've kind of got big tax write-offs for these fossil fuel companies. They're, they're still there. Uh, and the amount of new mines and new projects being uh, green lit is, is still happening. There, there's still... Uh, you know, projects every week that get green lit and you're like, well, f- f- what's another word for f-? <laughs> golly, golly, golly <laughs> gee, ain't that the darndest thing? Ain't that the darndest? Gee, that stinks, mister. Um, and that, that's probably the best way to put it. Ah, shucks. Yeah, they did it again. Um, so, yeah, that's it's it really it's terrible to kind of see that these big fossil fuel projects are still being kind of um, supported by the government and the ones that aren't are for political reasons, which I'm sure we'll get into in a moment. But yeah, so here's the thing. Australians want climate action. The Australian government is, has been held captive by the fossil fuel companies. So it, it seems interesting to me because there, there are lots of rules and regulations regarding things that come into the country, such as, animals you know there's like you know these <laughs> if large... you bring a mango into this country <laughs> you're gonna go to jail <laughs> well you know it's 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 just you know there's lots of it, there's a history of invasive species you know you have the cane uh-huh. toad you have yeah. rabbits all these things but then white people yeah <laughs> but also i guess yeah, i've lived experience <laughs> right <laughs> um it, but when it comes to like you know it, it fossil fuels particularly like in a place like the northern territories there's apparently this fracking project that um there's the 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 government the federal government uh, i guess you can say this better than i can but apparently in the northern territories there was like an independent review to see if these recommendations to to begin fracking in the beetaloo basin what 
recommendations did they satisfy exactly, and why is this fracking project going forward? Oh yeah, two weeks ago, the uh, the Northern Territory government said yes, uh, Santos and their Beetaloo Basin fracking can go ahead because they've made all they've met all of the environmental recommendations from an independent report. Um, but that's not what happened. Uh, they only made a few of those recommendations, including uh, the, some of the ones they didn't, which was including will this project uh, affect. Will this project affect climate change? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know anything about methane, um, but yes, uh, methane extraction and fugitive emissions do affect climate change. And they obviously didn't. They obviously, this, is, this gigantic gas project is not going to meet those recommendations. But despite that, the government has just bald-facedly gone, yeah, they've met the recommendations. We're going to approve it. And this is a weird thing. The uh, Northern Territory, I guess the the best way to kind of articulate what is the Northern Territory similar to. Imagine if Alaska uh, wasn't a state, um, but uh, but was like just run by a, a, a bunch of uh, like backward cowboys. Uh, that's, that's kind of like, that's kind of, it. that's kind of it. It's like, it's no, there's no real, they don't get to say, they don't get to have kind of self-determination. Ultimately, the territory is run by the federal government and the federal government is run by the fossil fuel lobby. <laughs> so it's kind of like, they can say, they can say these, they can say these things, but the, there's no, there's no legislature to kind of overrule what the chief minister has decided. So, yeah, it's a very strange thing. Like, this is crazy. The, the, the emissions from the Beetaloo Basin are going to be double all of Australia's domestic flights emissions since aviation was invented. Like, that's the that's the kind of emissions we're talking about here. Like, it is it is significant amount of emissions that are going to be created because of this. So, yeah, it's, um, it's totally wild. <sighs> that's... That's a lot of emissions. Um, <laughs> it, it kind of, uh, and it, and it's methane. You can't. It's not like helium. You, there's, right. there's no benefit to breathing it in. You don't get a funny voice. I mean, it's terrible. It's a, it's, it's a, oh, I don't. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, it seems. It, it, is that even worse than? Uh, there was like this gas project, the Barossa Gas pod Project, or uh, the uh, offshore drilling plans in the the Timor Sea, um, that actually was was blocked. I. Uh, the the, uh, the Tiwi Islands indigenous leader won the court case on, on that one against Santos Limited. Um, that supposedly was supposed to be like one of the dirtiest gas projects in Australia. Um, so it does seem like there are some victories happening. There are these little wins, right? So there are these little wins um, against the big, big companies. Uh, but then there are these gigantic projects that just are still happening. So it's... Um, it's really hard when the world can't, when, you know, the International Energy Agency says you can't actually, we can't actually survive if any more coal or gas projects get greenlit and you see constantly these projects get greenlit, it's very demoralizing. But, you know, there are these small wins from time to time. And um, even in the Galilee Basin, um, seeing Clive Palmer's project fall over, that was really wonderful to see too, particularly from the local First Nations group. They have been defending the land there since um, workers went in to kind of clear it. Um, that's that was really heartening. So, and then, then there are these small, there are really small wins, but the the losses are catastrophic. Do you think that? Um, do you think these these wins, particularly for you know indigenous communities, do you think this portends more acknowledgement of land rights for indigenous communities? Um, that's a good question. That's a question I think I can't answer. Probably, you know, um, a First Nations person has a better handle on, but. Um, certainly it's, it's thrilling to see folks organizing and pushing their shoulders against, with the legal infrastructure that exists against these companies. And it's, it's heartening to see groups like the Environmental Defender Office and other legal entities like that help folks out like that. So that it's, it's great to see, but it all happens in regional areas. And so part of our job, I feel like with the rational fear is to get these people on our podcast and talk to them about what's happening and kind of celebrate those wins. And that's what we do from time to time, just so that folks know that bad stuff's happening, but good stuff's happening too. Has anyone ever uh, reached out to you to, you know, let you know like that your podcast has had an effect on them and what they're doing on the ground? Um, uh, well, like I said, in Glasgow, that was, uh, that right. was, a, that was a real fun moment. Um, but, um, 
I don't know. I don't, no, no one really has. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows if it actually has helped? What I can tell you is like when, 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 when we've done regional tours, we do live shows of the podcast too. Um, that's really heartening to have people come out and fill a venue want to talk about climate change, particularly in areas where uh, we did a show. We did a climate vulnerable tour. We went to Newcastle, which is a big coal mining town, all about the transition away from coal. And we had an incredible comedian, Kirsten Drysdale. She was on the show. Her husband was in the, in the audience. Her husband works in the mines. And she was talking about how to carbon offset him. And there was a real fun, <laughs> really kind of funny kind of moment where they were talking about the, the anguish that they have in their family because their whole lively, livelihood is wrapped up in, in fossil fuels, but they hate, they hate the way it is at the moment. So really interesting, a difficult conversation. Then we went to Bega down south in the south coast of New South Wales, um, completely devastated by bushfires in 2019. One of the hardest hit places in Australia because of it. And on the way down, we were a little bit nervous about doing a show about bushfires in a place like Bega. Um, and the journalist who was kind of writing about us, she was like, don't you think it's cruel to be doing jokes about bushfires? I'm like, well, we're not going to be doing jokes about bushfire victims. <laughs> I don't know. What, do you, what kind of jokes do you think we're going to be making about bushfires? Ha <laughs> ha, your house burned down. We're not going to be doing that. We're going to be making jokes about climate change policy and all these things. And it was really heartening during that show to see how well it went down, but also folks coming up after us at the pub while we were having dinner just to say, you know, thanks for coming to this little place to tell jokes about this issue because we need to talk about this more. Um, so there have been moments like that, which was, it's so hard. Like it makes you go, oh, f f this loss making show was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Despite all the bad news and despite how, you know, the, the lack of action from government or industry, um, do you see any seeds of change being planted? Like, where are you drawing optimism from? So there's a lot happening in the energy space, right? So the, th the three big areas for emissions in Australia are energy. This is not scope three, by the way, just scope two. Energy, transport, agriculture. And what you're seeing at the moment are these incredible gains in emissions reduction around energy. Energy is like dropping off a cliff at the moment. There's a lot, so much renewable energy coming online. Australia has the highest uptake of solar in any other country in the world. Um, uh, and I can, I, you know, I can see it even in my own family. Like there's a race to put solar panels on the roof, to get batteries on the wall, to move to electric vehicles. Um, my brothers have all done that. I've just bought a house with solar panels. So it's like, it's, it's, you know, you can see this urge, folks want to do more, and you can see personal responsibility coming to the fore in that regard. And th then transport, that's happening at scale too. So you see, right now in Australia, you're seeing Teslas and Polestars, and you're seeing um, so much in terms of personal transport mm, electrifying, which is super interesting. And uh, that's... Yeah, backed up by infrastructure paid for by the federal government and local government and state government. So corporations like the NRMA are putting in power charging in regional Australia everywhere. Uh, there's a, there's great uh, groups of uh, local electorates who are doing their own supercharging networks in regional areas. And so this is kind of, it, it, there's a real uh, pardon the pun, real energy around <laughs> energy, right? You can see this happening. So that's really hopeful. Uh, uh, the Australian energy market operator is about to launch the biggest battery in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, there's, there's stuff happening and that's great. We see the dismantling of power plants, uh, coal power plants, uh, aged infrastructure like Liddell, and that whole area is being turned into what's called a RES, a renewable energy zone. Um, so the state governments are backing in a lot of renewables and a lot of kind of green energy projects. So that's really exciting. Uh, and then transport's the next thing. But the transport, we have a problem in Australia. There's just not the kind of money to build the, the big green infrastructure for transport, the fast trains and stuff like that. But um, it'd be nice to see. And then agriculture is the next one. It's going to be harder to abate, but um, there's great, interesting experiments that are kind of kind of slowly filtering their way through agriculture, like um, rewilding, stuff like that. But also, uh, have you heard of the seaweed? The seaweed experiments that have been run to put seaweed in cattle feed to reduce methane. 
I, I've heard a little bit, but why don't you tell me a little bit more about it's, it? So there's these dudes in Tasmania. They worked out that if you farm seaweed and you put it in cattle's feed, you can reduce the methane output of cattle by about 95%. Like it's it's literally, it's not literally, it's it's figuratively a silver bullet. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so it's literally seaweed. That's what it is. It's literally seaweed. It's figuratively a silver bullet. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. So those, that's kind of, that's kind of compelling in an agriculture sense. Um, but there, there still needs to be great, there's still great gains there to be had with the supporting of green infrastructure around agriculture. So energy is good. Energy is on the way. Transport is kind of on the way and agriculture is picking up. And then the big question is the scope three emissions, right? That is the, that's the big, no one ever talks about scope three. No one ever says, um, no one ever, no one ever says that Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. <laughs> no one ever acknowledges that those fossil fuels are eventually going to be burnt in other countries and be put into the atmosphere, an atmosphere that is also above Australia. No one ever says that. But I'm here to say it. That's what we are. It's go Saudi Arabia, Russia, then us. Actually, it's probably more Saudi Arabia, us, then Russia. Probably now. Um, so it's like that's that's what's happening. So you know, we might be doing, we might be making huge gains in our own emissions, but the emissions that we export offshore are just astronomical, and that's the industry that's supported by fossil fuel. Um, subsidies, and we don't need we don't need to give those folks subsidies anymore. They've got enough money; they can they can live without it. Well, um, switching gears here. I mean, that was all. <laughs> that's all very good information for us to know. Um, but <laughs> was it too much? <laughs> no, no, no. I was just like, it's a good. It's a. I didn't have a follow up to that. I was like, I gotta have a follow up to this. I'm like, no, don't have one. He just <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll, no, he uh, said, he it's probably said too it wonky for everybody at home. No, it's it's good. Um, I was gonna I was gonna see if you had anything I should to say po- about. I, well, I should point out that Rational Fear is really a comedy podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> just not gonna mention that. Just go to the little show. No one, no one will know it's a comedy podcast. Uh, but uh, I was gonna ask if you had it like in in America, like this thing called agroforestry. It's having a really big moment right uh-huh. now, and there's a lot of potential behind it. I don't know. Has has that p- picked up any steam here? Is anyone talking about agroforestry in Australia? Any- uh, agroforestry um, is this where people are being paid to build. Put, put trees on their on their land rather than yeah so it's like when you take um when you take woody perennials you know like bushes trees shrubs or you know chestnuts hazelnuts whatever mm. type of you know crop comes from that but planting it alongside traditionally what would be monocultures so you know just oh, like c- corn instead of just corn you have a corn and you also have some trees that sounds very wholesome yeah <laughs> yeah sounds <laughs> it, really good I mean it increases the nutrient profile of the soil and like uh, helps with like water retention oh. and reduces erosion and that kind of stuff uh there are some there's lots of folks who are into kind of um, regenerative farming and that's it's kind of the term we kind of give for that yeah so gotcha. there's, there's there's that um, so that that that's kind of more of a a small scale trend it's not huge um, there aren't there aren't really subsidies to kind of push that but that's just what people are doing on their own and then there is the huge scandal of kind of carbon credits you get for for planting trees on your on your farmland and things like that and that is a very murky territory we probably don't have time to get into but it is a lot of kind of it's kind of it's kind of just been debunked lately in Mm -hmm. terms of the the effectiveness of of having carbon credits and, and paying farms to build tree to put put trees in the ground um and to offset your own carbon emissions as a company so or, or, or whatever um so that's that's kind of had this big scandal moment in australia right now so yeah we're trying to trying to kind of one of the things i saw in the eu this week is the eu has basically said um any company that says they are meeting net zero emissions by carbon credits will be discredited and that's exciting. Like it's exciting as the European Union go, well, you know, carbon credits are bullshit. Let's not do that. Right. <laughs> that's exciting. And hopefully things that happen in Europe generally take six years to hit Australia. So in six years' time, that's where we'll be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, hopefully a little bit sooner than that. Um, yeah, they seem to be, you know, the EU has that, you know, the, the deforestation-free law for the commodities that enter the EU. That that, that one's making waves right now. Um, but, you know, I know we're short on time. So uh, really quick, I just wanted to point out that on on Irrational Fear, you have a segment called News Fighters where you sort of break down, you know, overly simplistic or perhaps misleading headlines. And as a journalist, 
I really appreciate that. And I just wanted to ask you, but what are some news organizations that you see getting it right or reporting on climate change or the environment in a fair manner, fair and accurate manner? Uh, I subscribe to Hated on the Substack. I love Hated. Uh, it's a, one of my favorite Substacks. Excellent. Um, I also love The Guardian in Australia. They do incredible work locally. And also locally, there's a great outfit called Renew Economy. Renew Economy is the industry outlet for renewables. And they do super in-depth investigations and articulation around policy. And that's usually where I turn to to kind of understand something that might have happened in climate in Australia. I'll be like, well, I'm going to go check out whoever's written about it in Renewal Economy. They're the biggest nerds in the game. They'll be able to articulate it in a much more succinct way than than whoever is covering it at, at Nine or or Fairfax or, or the other news organizations in Australia because that's that's what they do day in, day out. Um, yeah, Renewal Economy, it, it started off as this blog, but now it's like this really full-on, well-resourced news outlet, which not only looks at energy, but the whole um, uh, climate change space. I, I, really, I really love Renewal Economy. Nice. Well, um, are there any podcasters, environmentally focused podcasters out there that you recommend? Uh, if you're not already li- listening to, you know, Outrage and Optimism, it is such a great podcast. Um, uh, do you know Outrage and Optimism? I do. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. I love it. It's very good. Um, our podcast, Irrational Fear, it's very good. <laughs> very good. It's a comedy <laughs> podcast. Uh, it's, very, it's, very, it's very parochial. And, uh, and, uh, and so if you, if you like jokes about Australian, Australian news and climate change, listen to it. Um, uh, uh, there's another one in Australia called Serious Danger. That is a podcast run by my friend Tom Ballard. Um, it's a, it's not a greens podcast. It's a podcast about greens politics. It's very good. Um, uh, energy insider is renewable economies podcast. I listen to that. Uh, it's weird to be an, a, a, a comedian and talk about, <laughs> uh, talk about how I really love energy insider. <laughs> so, uh, and, um, uh, the vaults podcast. Um, yeah. Dave Roberts, uh, Dave Robert. F- I love him. I could listen to him all day long. He is one of my favorites. I don't know don't know him. I know he's going through a tough time at the moment with his health. So I hope wish him well. But that is um, one of my favorite podcasts to turn to when I want to understand what's happening in America. Um, uh, he's articulate and passionate and smart, and he's at the cutting edge of, um, of great conversation. And I, re- I really like it. And even though... Even though it's a pro-nuclear podcast, sometimes I listen to Decoupled uh, uh, with the healthy understanding that whoever's making it is clearly in the pocket of big yellow cake and good on them. Um, but sometimes they have really great conversations around around energy. So, yeah. Well, Dan, uh, it has been... Uh, it's been great having you on the, the newscast. I've tried my hardest not to laugh. <laughs> it's really well, difficult. yeah, and I'm really f-ing sorry for all the bleeping <laughs> you're going to have to do. I'm just, you know, trying to not upset all the c**ts out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, uh, that's funny. Uh, well, Dan, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for appearing on the Mongabay newscast. Uh, real quick before you leave, where do you? Where can people find you? Uh, social media? Just um, look up a rational fear. It's it's kind of like a, a joke on a current affair. Um, it's not irrational fear. I want to make that absolutely clear. I've probably chosen the wrong name. <laughs> it was really funny ten years ago when I when I cut it when I started when I started the podcast. Um, but yeah, arationalfear.com is the best place. Sign up to f- sign up. Uh, just give me your email. We'll send you a new podcast every week. All right, Dan Dan Illich, thank you so much. As we say in Australian media, good to be with you. Good to be with you. <laughs> If you want to check out Irrational Fear, you can find a link here in the show notes or by searching for A Rational Fear on the podcast platform of your choice. As always, if you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast and you want to help us out, you can spread the word by telling a friend about our show. It's really the best way to expand our reach and keep growing. But you can also help us out by leaving a review on the platform you're tuning in on. Or you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Manga Bay. We are a non-profit news outlet, and even just a dollar per month will really help us offset the production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com 
forward slash Manga Bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. You and your friends can join the listeners who have downloaded the Manga Bay newscast over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And yes, you can always read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com, or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, find Manga Bay on most of the social platforms out there, including Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Mastodon, and others with the handle at Mongabay or on Twitter at Mongabay Org. Thanks, as always, for listening. <laughs>